I'm Sean Delaney, and today on the What Got You There podcast, I sit down with one of the greatest coaches in all of athletics, and that's the UNC women's soccer coach, Anson Durrance. Now, Anson has won over 22 national championships during his 40 years of coaching. So if you want a masterclass on leadership, developing personal excellence, and how to create a winning culture, you will love this conversation. What Got You There is a podcast for high achievers looking to learn from the most successful people of all time, what their strategies, lessons, and routines are that made them successful. Now it's your journey, so it's time to learn what's going to get you there. Coach, I think one of the best places to start is around the Calvin and Hobbes cartoon, and I would love to know the lasting impression that cartoon had on you. Well, first of all, yeah, I use that cartoon all the time when I'm talking about, uh, I guess, our basic philosophy, because um, um, I actually studied philosophy at UNC. I ended up with a double major in philosophy and English. And um, so for me, your philosophy is actually uh, important. And of course, that cartoon is basically a cartoon about a philosopher uh, and his alter ego. <laughs> And the thing that's really cool about that cartoon that I really appreciate, he's talking about the way he wants to live his life. And of course, the irony is he talks about wanting to live on this never ending ascension while he's sort of going downhill. And then he's talking about just going up and up. And of course, he's flying off a cliff. And the thing I like about that is uh, the sort of dilemma that our philosophies uh, place us in, because even though we all have, I think, the correct ambition most of the time, about wanting to live an extraordinary life or about you know working hard or living a principle-centered existence. Of course, uh, uh, the real world gets in the way. And so uh, what I loved about Calvin is, is he explained to his tiger friend that uh, you know this is the way he wants to live. That's not the, what was happening. So he professed one philosophy as he's descending into an abyss. And so I think that's the challenge of uh, trying to live your best life. I think all of us uh, uh, that are serious about trying to live our best lives, I think uh, the real challenge is actually doing it. Because I think it's one thing to come up with a philosophy of living on this never ending ascension, and then actually achieving it. uh, Because life is difficult. And so for me, uh, that cartoon checks every box. It checks the box of having, I think, an excellent (laughs) philosophy. And then it checks the box of uh, uh, what ends up happening most of the time, which is, you know, um, yeah, you go flying off a cliff. What does never ending ascension look like in your life today as you are starting to fly off that cliff? Yeah. So uh, obviously it's the philosophy I've tried to adapt uh, for my program and the people in my program. And the really nice thing about the age that I get these uh, uh, young people uh, to join me at is, uh, you know, 17 or 18 and and then I have them until you know my 20 21 22 and this is a really important part of their lives because this is the first time they're completely free to make choices on their own uh before then uh basically uh uh they were in this uh bridled existence of obedience and they had to genuflect to uh, a moral authority Uh, The moral authority uh, were basically the people in their homes, their mom and their dads. And now all of a sudden, they're free. And so my challenge is to take these kids that are finally free for the first time, that don't have to be obedient day to day, because the parents aren't here. So if they want to sleep all day, they can. If they want to cut every class, they can. If they want to not do any homework that night, they can. If they want to eat pizza for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, they can. If they want to go out drinking every night, they can. They have this incredible, uh, I guess, burst of freedom that's sort of uh, given to them. And then the question is then, how are you going to live? And uh, what I'm hoping they decide to do is to live an extraordinary life. And for that to happen, uh, the most critical element is for them to develop a principle center and have that gu- guide their choices and decisions. Because I think with the correct principle center, you can lead an extraordinary life. And so uh, do I want them to have this freedom? Yeah, I do. But I also want them to, 
use it properly. So it just has me thinking about you taking responsibility for your own life. And there's a story from your sophomore year of high school. You had it when you were over in Switzerland, you had an algebra teacher. Do you, you know what I'm talking about here? Yeah. Can, can you share the story? Yeah, that's uh, Mr. Dunleavy. I really uh, I, I came to appreciate him more and more the older I got. At the time, um, he was confusing because he came in the first day of class. And when you go to a boys boarding school, uh, and you can speak to anyone that has been educated in these environments, um, you want to sort of ascend into boarding school legend. You want to do something that is remembered for the rest of the exist your existence and the existence of all of your classmates. And so you spend half your time rebelling against the environment you're in <clears throat> because you're with, you know, a bunch of other hooligans uh, and you are also free of, you know, the moral authority of your parents. And so to some extent, you know, I lived the freedom a little bit earlier than most kids because uh, boarding school, you're more or less, uh, you know, free of at least the shackles of your mother and father. And so you do get to explore your freedom a bit more. And so we go into this, uh, this math class and Mr. Dunleavy uh, sits us all down and says, okay, uh, you know, gentlemen, uh, we're gonna give you a homework assignment every day. And of course, you know, that's ho-hum. Of course, every you know, professor is gonna give us a homework assignment every day. And then he sort of went the direction that no other professor had gone in, on in my experience. He said, uh, I'm going to give you this homework assignment uh, <clears throat> and you don't have to do it. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, okay, where's the catch? He's going to say, but if you decide not to do it, make sure that whatever you decide to do in place of it is more important to you than lowering your grade, this small percentage. And then he put all the numbers up on the board. And sure enough, if you miss just one homework assignment, the effect it would have on your grade would be next to nothing because we had a homework assignment every day. So, you know, no big deal. You miss one or two. I mean, it doesn't really affect your grade negatively. And uh, he said, so it's not going to affect your grade that much. Uh, now, are you going to, you know, not understand the material as well as if you had done the whole homework assignment? Yep. But just make sure that whatever you decide in place of doing this homework is more important to you than lowering your grade this small percentage or having it compromise your understanding of the material this, this, this tiny bit. Just make sure that you're making choices that are more important to you than that. And we're all thinking to ourselves, heck, even sleeping is more important to us than this bloody math class we're taking. So it was like, this is, there's got to be some catch somewhere. And then he added something at the end, which I thought was also particularly profound. And he says, by the way, I'm never going to sit in judgment of your choices. <clears throat> Please understand uh, these are choices you get to make because you get to decide uh, on who you're going to be. And uh, he left it at that. And sure enough, you know, we would, uh, you know, skip doing homework for a week uh, in hopes that he would ask us, you know, Anson, I haven't seen your homework assignment uh, for the week. Uh, you know, what, what have you been doing in place of it? And I was going to tell him, you know, something outrageous I had done that was so much more compelling to me than, you know, this ridiculous math homework that I was giving. Um, and uh, he never indulged us. He never questioned uh, about us not doing the homework. And it was sort of later in life when it dawned on me, he was the first person that completely, well, treated me completely like an adult. And um, and I've really benefited from that because uh, almost immediately, I think everyone in that class uh, really thought Mr. Dunleavy was cool because he wasn't judgmental uh, and he wasn't overbearing and he was a fine teacher and he tried to teach us everything he knew about the math class we were taking. And yet he didn't sit in judgment of the choices we made about whether or not we decided to commit to it. And I genuinely appreciated it. And I was listening last night to, uh, I'm trying to think of what it was. Uh, maybe it was a podcast. I can't remember anymore. But uh, this guy was talking about uh, uh, aphorisms. Uh, maybe this was a political show. Uh, and he was talking about different things he could put on a T-shirt. And one of the things he put on his T-shirt, oh, by the way, it's five o'clock and I haven't used algebra all day. 
So uh, what this guy was basically telling us in a really powerful way for me is there are a lot of ways you can spend your time. So just make sure the way you spend your time is more important than whatever else you've rejected on other ways you could spend your time. And I have lived my life knowing that everything that has happened to me, I've invited because I've somehow chosen it. And it was just a really, really profound lesson. It's a lesson I would love uh, for every one of my University of North Carolina women's soccer player graduates to take with them. Hmm. Coach, you clearly have this, this inner drive for excellence. And I'm wondering for you, when that realization of who you want to become really resonated and became clear for you? Wow. I guess if I look at um, my upbringing, uh, I was born and raised overseas. <clears throat> and so you really get a different sort of, uh, I guess, view of the world when every three years you move. Um, so for me, my refuge, every time we moved, was jumping into the local sport. And as a result, the sports world is uh, the place I made all of my friends. But it was also the world where, where I felt very comfortable in, wherever I was, whether it was Bombay, Calcutta, you know, Nairobi, Addis Ababa, Singapore, you know, Brussels or Freeborg, the boys boarding school I attended. Um, and that was the environment I felt comfortable in. I also, also felt very comfortable in any sport competing uh, because for me, I was more alive when I was competing in a sport. I learned this a lot later. I'm actually an introvert. So I had no trouble with, you know, uh, not being a, a social center or, you know, not talking to people. Um, but the, uh, the environments that came alive then usually had something to do with sport and the people I was involved in, in that sport and not just my teammates, but even the people I competed against. And I felt incredibly comfortable in that world. Uh, so comfortable that uh, um, I think I developed uh, an expertise in something that was given to me by just playing all these different sports while I was growing up. In fact, uh, the best way for me to share this story with you is uh, uh, I was listening to a political show uh, and I listened to all the political shows, Blue and Red, and this particular day, I was listening to Rachel Maddow, who's a, a liberal commentator, political commentator. And she was bringing on some expert to talk about something that she was addressing. And then all of a sudden, uh, the expert turned around and said, by the way, uh, uh, Rachel, what are you an expert in? And it sort of took her aback for a second because she actually thought about this and she didn't have a quick, snappy re reply. She said, uh, after thinking about it for a while, I am an expert in reading comprehension. And I was thinking to myself, well, that's interesting because she could say, you know, she's an expert on national politics or, or something. She could sort of answer the question the way they would advertise her show. And she didn't answer it that way. She didn't ever, uh, she didn't answer it to, you know, try to attract more viewers to her show by claiming to be an expert in something. But what she claimed to be an expert in explained why she is my favorite political commentator. Because what she does better than anyone else is she explains things to me. And the way she explains it, she articulates things so well and explains it so well. I know one of the reasons she does is because she understands everything she reads and she can take some, something she reads and turn it into her own language and explain it to me in a way that I can understand it. Whereas if I read the same passage that she read, I wouldn't have the same comprehension. And I was saying, that's really, really interesting. And then I started thinking, well, what am I an expert in? I certainly know a lot about sports or, or soccer, but I don't think that sets me apart. I think there are a lot of people that know a lot about sport and know a lot about their sport. The more I thought about it, this is what I'm an expert in. I am an expert in competition. Give me the rules and structure for a game and I will beat you at it because I am extraordinarily competitive, but I also know how to focus 
and I know how to exploit the rules of the game to, to basically win. I'm not going to do this by cheating, but I'm going to figure out a way to outcompete you, outfocus you, create an environment that's going to create a better competitor in me. <clears throat> And you're going to get beaten because that's my expertise. My expertise is give me an environment and I'm going to figure out a way to win in that environment. Uh, and uh, that was from going all over the world as a boy, jumping into the local culture and trying to dominate it. How do you get your players? How do you impart this personal drive for excellence, this personal drive for competition, for them to feel it in their bones like you do? When I started coaching, my philosophy was I wanted to design an environment I would love to play in. Mm. So for me, these are the most important things. I hate rules. I hate people telling me what to do. Uh, I bristle at that. So I created a culture where we don't have any rules. We don't even have the rule of, you know, show up on time or whatever. Um, now, obviously, I expect you to show up on time. And that gets back to Mr. Dunleavy. I'm going to treat you like an adult. And so I don't think you have to tell an adult, oh, by the way, show up on time. No, I think that's taken for granted. And I think so much of the things that are roles are things we should all take for granted. And so <clears throat> I'm not going to structure this, you know, this rule environment where basically the only reason you show up on time is because I've told you to. I would like to think the reason you show up on time is because you respect me, you respect your teammates, you respect the environment where we've created. <clears throat> and that's the reason you showed up on time, because you respect yourself and uh, you expect to be respected, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully <clears throat> one of the reasons you show up on time is because you are principle centered and you want to lead that kind of life. So I don't like rules, but I do like principle centers. And then when you show up for me, the environment I would love to have, the environment I would love to compete in, I would love to know at the end of every practice, I am the alpha. I would like for them to declare publicly that I was the best player in practice that day. And then the next day, I would like to compete to be the best player again. And I would like that declared. So that's what we do. We have this thing called the competitive cauldron. <clears throat> we have 28 different competitive categories. And I want, at the end of the semester, I wanted to be declared the alpha. I want to be the one that dominated, on average, all 28 categories. And now we've taken that to such an extreme, not only do we still have the competitive cauldron, which is the 28 different categories and a bulletin board that's updated every day before practice, but now we have uh, an analytics team. And these are uh, gentlemen and ladies that are studying statistics at the University of North Carolina. They're getting uh, a degree in uh, data analysis and they're taking my practice and they're turning that practice into data. And at the end of that day, they get together as an anal analytics team and they rank that day's practice performance based on the five or six different exercises we ran with a measure on who won each exercise and where they ranked in that day's particular exercise with an overall ranking at the end of the day, and by around 10 o'clock or 10.30 p.m., they email out the results from that day's training session. So at the end of every day, someone's number one, and someone's number, let's assume if we have 30 players in the team and four of them are goalkeepers, in the field player thing, someone's number one and someone's number 26. And the other players were scattered somewhere in between, and the goalkeepers in their pod of four, someone's number one, someone's number two, someone's number three, and someone's number four. And that's emailed to them that night. So the amount of information they get is immediate. And uh, it's powerful. And that's what we do to drive competitive fire. Because if you're not competitive, you're not even going to look at it. If you're competitive, you're going to look at it every day. You're going to come to practice and take a sneak at the big bulletin board. And every single night when that email comes in, you're going to check just to see where you were. And then if you're competitive, you're going to make a decision. Oh my gosh, I had my ass kicked today. Well, that's not going to happen tomorrow. Or if you're a beta, oh my gosh, my ass was kicked again. Well, it looks like that's going to happen again tomorrow. It depends on who you are. <clears throat> and so for me, that's what drives performance in my environment. Coach, when you bring up the competitive cauldron, do you have a player over the years that your mind just goes to as someone who thrived in that environment and a story that could bring this to life in terms of that competitive inner drive they had? 
Absolutely. My favorite story is uh, the April Heinrich story. April Heinrichs is from Littleton, Colorado. <clears throat> and when I started recruiting her, um, I wasn't used to recruiting women. I was used to recruiting men. And you're the perfect one to talk to about this, by the way, because you've experienced, you know, competing at a collegiate level in men's sports. So you'll understand <clears throat> how simple it was to recruit you <clears throat> to a school like North Carolina. So I'll give you my typical men's recruiting call back in the day. So this would be like early 80s. So I'm recruiting a male athlete. Hello, my name is Anson Dorrance. I've seen you play. I think you can step in and start for me as a freshman. <clears throat> I've got uh, a full scholarship for you. Um, the guy grunts a couple times. Great. See you in August. <laughs> That's men's recruiting. Yeah, it's pretty spot on. Like this. Yeah, I mean, a school like this, someone offers you a full scholarship, which basically tells you you're going to start. Um, that's it. You don't need to know anything else. And so I was thinking, my gosh, I'm clearly a brilliant recruiter. I can't wait to start recruiting young women. So I get on the phone with April Heinrichs and hello, April. My name's Anson Dorrance. <clears throat> I'm the soccer coach at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I've seen you play. I've got some money for you. I think you can step in and compete to start as a freshman. I'm trying to hang the phone up. And she says, uh, coach, coach, hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, um, how does your team get along? I was thinking to myself, oh my gosh, that's an interesting question. Um, I would call the following week, April, we got some money for you. I think you can step in at right wing and start for us. Um, uh, and again, I'm trying to hang the phone up. Uh, uh, coach, coach, how does your team get along? Every single time I called her, she wanted to extend the conversation by asking me how my team got along. I was thinking to myself, who cares? When I played at UNC, I mean, you know, um, the center forward, you know, had horrible breath. You know, I could play with him. I didn't have to hug him and we didn't have to have a you know, fraternity ritual together. You know, the right back was missing teeth. I mean, he was a horrible example of the human race, but we could play together. I mean, I didn't understand what this, you know, get along thing meant because I could get along with anyone, you know, as long as they were ass kickers, I could play with them. You know, we didn't have to, you know, join the same fraternity or whatever, or join the same you know, go to the same gentleman's club every Friday night. So I didn't understand what the hell the question meant. So I invented something. April, they get along great. You know, who knew, who cares? So anyway, she ends up coming. And all of a sudden in preseason, it dawned on me why she kept asking me that question about how my team got along. Because she comes in and basically destroys the rest of the freshman class. She's clearly the alpha in that class. Then she proceeds to basically beat up on all the sophomores, embarrass all the juniors and humiliate all the seniors and all of a sudden one player after another is coming into my office saying coach what are you going to do about april what are you going to do about april i was thinking to myself well cloner are you <laughs> kidding me this is the greatest thing i had ever seen what do you mean what i'm going to do about april do you want me to get her to transfer to duke do you want to play against oh no 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 no. we don't want to play against her i said i want you guys to play like her the thing I loved about April is in every single environment and team she had been on in her life, they hated her. Why did they hate her? They hated her because she was extraordinary. And she didn't compromise anything to let her teammates feel comfortable against her in practice. She annihilated everyone in every minute of every practice and every game. She wasn't there to win Miss Congeniality. She was there to compete. She was there to basically rip heads off, tear legs off. And that is the way you become extraordinary. <clears throat> so uh, for me, that's the environment I wanted. When I was the U.S. Women's National Coach, I was hired in 1986. When I was hired to coach the U.S. Women's National Team, the United States had never won a game in international competition. Let me say that again. When I was hired in 1986, the United States women's national team had never won a game in international competition. Five years later, we were world champions. Who was the first player I picked for that roster? Heinrichs. And then the other players I picked that came in, I pointed at Heinrichs and I said, that is how we're going to train. We're going to train like we're sharks with blood in the water. We're going to go after each other in practice so that the game is going to be feeling like a vacation for you. So that's how hard practice is going to be. Coach, this and makes me 
Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go. Yeah, no, but to this day, uh, the United States is still on top of the world. That culture hasn't changed, and that's critical. What's critical if you want to be extraordinary, certainly in a contact sport, is competition. This reminds me of Jeff Bezos. The Amazon founder wrote in his 1997 shareholder letter that high standards are contagious and throw someone with high standards in this environment. So I I'm wondering the other players, how quickly can they rise up to that standard that someone like April sets? Is that possible? Yes. Um, and then all of a sudden they all feed off each other because then we do have athletes on the national team that can compete with April. So now mm -hmm. for April to survive and be the alpha, she's got to grind up her platform even more. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite statements in Mia Hamm's book, Go for Goal, is she wrote the statement down, when I got to North Carolina, I could finally be the athlete that I was. Because like with April, in so many environments, in the way we raise our girls and boys, it's so different. If a boy is competitive, he's put on a pedestal. If a girl is competitive, she's excoriated by her own culture. Like there's something wrong with her. There's nothing wrong with you. You're an alpha female. Come to paradise. Come to Chapel Hill. Because there's a coach there that's going to wrap his arms around you and protect you from the chaos of the universe. Protect you from all those betas that can't thrive because you're crushing them in every practice. No, you belong here. And so if you can create an environment like that for your elite athletes, honestly, male or female, you've done something. And that all comes back to culture. What does your culture embrace? That statement you made from uh, Bezos is fabulous. Yeah, that's contagious. And if we all embrace the fact that uh, we are gonna embrace competition, sure enough, competition is gonna be embraced. And can April also get even better if she's competing with a Michelle Akers or a Mia Hamm or a Christine Lilly or a Julie Foudy or a Karen Jennings Cabrera or Shannon Higgins or Linda Hamilton or Joy Fawcett or you know Carla Worden Overbeck? And that was my starting team in 1991 when we won the first world championship. Yes, they all have to get even better because to survive in that team of alphas, you've got to really work. And one of my favorite lines that April gave to a newspaper when they interviewed her about playing at North Carolina, <clears throat> she said uh, she never had to work so hard for so little dominance in her life. In other words, she knew the environment she was in was perfect for her because it made her even better. Coach, this has me thinking a lot into culture, something I, I'm, I'm fascinated by. I know you've spent years thinking about and developing when you're thinking about going into a new environment you mentioned and enter, entering the world team what what are the, the the levers you're trying to pull to influence culture early on besides just bringing great players like Heinrich in well first of all you introduce the cauldron you introduce basically uh, data uh and uh, the thing that's so important about data you want to be connected with your players in a very real way and the thing you learn uh, uh, early in coaching is a part of your responsibility in coaching is to take your player's personal narratives to the truth. Very rarely is a player's personal narrative true. It's shaped usually by parents when they're young or, you know, youth coaches uh, also when they're young. And usually uh, it's laced with some excuses to protect them from accountability and pain. And obviously if they're being protected and they have excuses uh, when they don't do well, uh, they're not getting to the truth fast enough because as soon as you can get an athlete to the truth, they get to make a decision on who they are. If their narrative is laced with excuses to protect them from the, the fact they're not good enough to start or whatever, um, they're protected from doing anything about it. Which again, takes me right back to uh, Mr. Dunleavy. What do you value? What do you value? Do you value starting? Get to work. Because right now, these people are ahead of you. Here's the data every single day. Do you value starting? Yes, I do. And I wind in my parents about it every night. And then they come back with me and tell me that I'm doing great. And I'm just, they're just so sorry I'm being cheated by the coach. And, you know, the small violin comes out and the parents start playing it in front of their child. Now they've completely wrecked their, their child. What the parents should say is, yeah, um, you want to start? Get it done. Kick everyone's ass in and practice. I hear that you have a competitive cauldron there. So maybe send me the results. Oh, no, no, mom, dad, you don't want the results. 
oh, does that mean you're at the bottom of all these charts? Uh, well, actually, you know, I am. Well, then, you know what? Get to work. I'll make a decision on who the hell you want to be. <clears throat> so this is why data-driven, I guess, challenges are the best. Because you can sort of weave and bob through subjective, uh, I guess, evaluations. No, let's make a performance objective and then perform. Go to that key decision-making moment. You're, you're holding up the data. You're holding up truth. Now the player gets to decide who the hell they're going to be in this world. Are, are there things you're doing so they don't play that victim mentality and go the opposite direction where they actually embrace the challenge to step up and really go after who they can become? I'm, I'm just wondering how you toggle that because that's, that's a balance beam. No, I mean, so yeah, no, some don't make it. Some uh, are not going to make it. But um, not everyone's going to be a champion. Yeah. So it's a very small club. But they have to decide whether or not they want to be in that club. Because let me tell you something about joining that club. Boy, does it take a lot of work. Because here's the other thing. I mean, there are so many different ways they're protected. Even when I was a national team coach, the problem I had early in my national coaching career was we would bring in 32 players on a Sunday. The next morning, the players didn't know if they were going to have a fitness test or a 1v1 tournament. Because the two things that I wanted the kids to make sure they could basically, I guess, control before they came into camp was to come in fit and to also make sure they played a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. Because back in the old days, we didn't have a lot of training camps and <clears throat> they weren't able to play on professional teams. Because back when I was the national team coach, there was no really pro league for the kids to play in. So I would give them basically a self-coaching uh, manual of things they had to do on their own. And one of the things that I emphasized was one-on-one. -on -one. <clears throat> if you want to become an elite soccer player, you have to have the ability to beat someone on the dribble, but also defend against a dribbler. So one of the best ways to prepare for our camps was to play one-on-one -on -one all the time. And Karen Jennings Gabera, who was the MVP of the 1991 World Championship, she had an incredible partner to play against one-on-one. -on -one. His name was Jim Gabera, the guy she ended up marrying. And Jim Gabera was the captain of the U.S. futsal team. So this was not an ordinary male soccer player. This was an incredibly skillful one. And so when Karen's playing against him one-on-one, -on -one, this is a war. And so trust me, there's no right back in the world, Karen was a left wing for me, that would be as good defensively as Jim Gabera. And so holy cow, that's the environment that she was training herself in in preparation for our camps. So they come in on a Sunday. Next morning, and in my first camp, I told them all to come in fit. And I told them if they didn't come in fit, I was going to send them home. So obviously I had to, you know, I guess show people I was a man of my word. So we did a fitness test. One girl flunked. Right after she flunked, I had the manager of my team <clears throat> gather all of her things together at that practice, drive her back to the motel she was staying in, and pack all of her bags, drive her to the airport, and we sent her home. That was the last time a player came in unfit. Nothing more humiliating than that. And so everyone came in fit, but they also came in playing 1v1. So through that week, we're doing all these things to compete in. So at the end of the week, there is a competitive call room. But here was the dilemma. On Sunday, we would play a, an 11v11 game. At the end of that game, I would get the girls together and either put in a bulletin board, you know, who made the team and who didn't. And then uh, they would go shower and clean up afterwards. And then I would have exit interviews with as many as I could before their flights left. The dilemma was for player 19. I'm taking 18 to the Mondialito in, in Italy and the other kids I'm not taking. So if you're a young woman <clears throat> and you have friends all over the roster and most of the girls do, they know the whole roster. If you don't make the team, you're going to walk up to your best friend that made the team and you're going to say, I didn't make it. Now, this is your friend. So here's the way your friend's going to react. The friend's not going to say, yeah, yeah, you had a very ordinary week this week. No, no, no. No friend ever tells you that, especially in the culture of girls and young women. They go, I couldn't believe it. Oh, my gosh, I thought you had an incredible week. And now the girl's thinking, I'll tell you, Anson is such an asshole. Uh, I was clearly one of the better players this week. Every player that made the team that's a friend of mine that I spoke to me, that spoke to me about it, told me that I was clearly one of the best players. And now 
I'm not on the roster. So now on the exit interview, the girl's sitting there with her arms folded. She's not listening to anything I'm saying. I need her. I can't, you know, dismiss the bottom part of my roster every time we have a camp just because I take 18 other girls on tour or playing in the, these national team games. No, I need every player on that roster to compete with the other girls. And this was just wasn't working. So finally, I devised this plan, and I still do it to this day with my college kids. They come in on a, a Sunday. They either have a one-on-one -on -one tournament the next day or a fitness test. And then the rest of the week, everything's a competition. And then on uh, Saturday night, we divide those 32 kids up into eight teams of four for a 4v4 tournament. Who are the eight people that are picking these 32 players? Their names are Mia Hamm, Christine Lilly, Julie Foudy. These are the best players on the United States national team. This is my starting eight. They're picking teams for the 4v4 tournament. Now, who do they pick? Do they pick their friends? No. This is being recorded. They want to win. They pick the ass kickers. The next day, we play an 11 the 11 game, and the final two players that aren't among the starters that picked the night before of the eight, because we have 10 starting field players, they pick the 11 the 11 teams. After that, we post the team, and now I'm sitting there with these kids that are having their exit interview. And the first question I ask them is, do you want to know your draft rank? And of course they do, because all of their friends have told them they should have made it and they haven't been picked. You were drafted 28th. So guess what? Everyone thinks you suck. Now, of course, I don't share that. I don't, I don't share it like that, but you were drafted 28th. So now for the first time, they're on the edge of their seat. Because now they want to know why Mia Hamm didn't pick them, why Julie Foudy didn't pick them. Basically, they want to know what they can do to win the respect of the 10 most respected field players for the United States full team. Because they want to be respected by them. They want to be picked by them in the top 18. Because very rarely, only on one occasion, <clears throat> did my selection process was any different than the 18 that I took to Europe with me. Only once. And that was, I was picking an athlete over a soccer player to see if I could develop her. And by the way, that was a failed experiment. But basically only one time did my 18 differ from the starters for the United States full national team. So now finally, they're listening to me. So on my teams, everyone knows their draft rank. They know if someone thinks they should be a starter or not. And everyone on the team gets to draft. So uh, this how much of, how much of a change have you seen from number eighteen climbing the ranks? Does that does that occur often? Yeah, usually eighteen climbing the ranks uh, on a collegiate team as a freshman uh, becoming a superstar by the time she graduates. So most freshmen are ranked lower, and then as they prove themselves uh, and win, they're ranked higher. And so that's the evolution of uh, your seniority. Now, uh, there are some seniors that are drafted very low because they never really uh, change their place. But freshmen usually start out a lot lower. And if they're elite, they can prove to the rest of the roster that they are elite and they can climb. How, how do you navigate confidence, both developing that confidence within the players and the team as a whole? Confidence is a huge issue, especially in women's sports. And it's one of the toughest things to navigate. A part of what might build confidence, honestly, are their competitive cauldron ranking. Mm. If they're consistently winning, that's going to construct confidence. My guess is if they're consistently losing, uh, either they're not doing the work or uh, they have an issue with confidence. And we've seen people on both sides of that divide. We've seen very good players lose confidence and then start to suffer. And we've seen very average players gain confidence and then start to thrive. And so this is the sort of uh, <clears throat> the bubbling part of the cauldron that's very interesting. Because uh, confidence is, that's hit or miss, honestly. The way we try to construct it is we try to have every player construct uh, a personal narrative that's the truth, first of all. And a part of that is understanding what her mantra is. Your mantra 
is what you are exceptional at. It's a statement, a positive statement about who you are at your best, but it's the truth. An affirmation is a positive statement of who you are and who you want to be. The affirmation might not be the truth, but it still has to be a positive statement about where you want to go. So the thing we use to construct confidence is the mantra and the affirmation. Every player should know their superpowers. And in every single player conference, we discuss them. And I tell them my opinion of why I recruited them. This is why I recruited you. And I think you're really good at this, this, and this. But there are things that I think we need to work on for you to get to the promised land. So let's talk about this, this, and this. And so a lot of this conversation is getting their personal narratives to the truth. And so for me in a player conference, I'm looking at 10 different areas where I want them to have a self-evaluation on. And those are self-discipline, competitive fire, self-belief, love of the ball, love of playing the game, love of watching the game, grit, coachability, connection, and energizing. All of those qualities, I think, have a huge impact on where you're going to go. And so I want each player to evaluate herself against all 10 of those qualities. And I want these players to use a five-point scale in giving themselves a grade in all 10 of those. If you think you're already a national team player in this category or an Olympic caliber player in this category, give yourself a five. If you think you're already at a professional level in this category, give yourself a 4.5. If you think you're a UNC starter in this category, give yourself a four. If you think you're a kid at UNC that deserves to play in every half as a substitute, give yourself a 3.5. If you think in this particular category, you're within the travel roster, give yourself a three, et cetera, all the way down to zero. So the kids are now evaluating themselves in these 10 different categories because I'm trying to sort out whether or not their personal narratives are close to the truth because I want their personal narratives at the truth so they can decide who they're going to be. Because again, uh, too many people and athletes for that matter have a personal narrative that's just fake. It's not true. Yeah, Coach, in uncovering that personal narrative, I, I know you have the, those 10 things that you're looking at. Is, is the personal narrative, is this a written out document in addition to that? Or is it just basically those 10 bullet points, the mantra um, and the aphorism? No, the uh, the uh, uh, the 10 things are things we discuss. Okay. And then they give themselves a grade. <clears throat> and with the exception of self-belief for them, and with the exception of coachability for me, we sort of debate this a little. <clears throat> so uh, if you were a freshman and you were attending my first meeting, of course, the freshman is terrified. This is the first player conference. And one of the things you're going to do in this player conference is you're going to recite to me the three core values, actually four core values that we expect all the freshmen to have memorized. And they come in, the first thing they do is they recite their core values. And so they've got to recite, you know, uh, to be a force of fortune, instead of a feverish, selfish little clot of ailments and grievances, complain that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. That's our non-whining uh, principle center. We don't believe in whining. So every kid not only has to be able to recite that, they have to be able to live that because I don't want to hear any frigging whining about anything. And so we have you know three others that all the freshmen memorize and recite in front of me before the player conference extends itself. And then we get into all those bullet points eventually. And those bullet points, so I ask, and I say, okay, on this five-point scale, where would you say your self-discipline is? Now, of course, uh, you're a freshman. Would you tell me your self-discipline would be at a five at a national team level or Olympic team level? Yes or no? No. Right. Would you tell me that uh, you're at a professional level? Yes or no? No. Right. Would you say that you were a starting caliber level player, though, in this category? Coach, now we're, now we're, now we're getting fine lines, but no. Uh, with, with the respect I have for your program, no. No, you would have to say yes. Why? Because you want to start. Hmm. If you're a freshman that doesn't want to start, I've made a mistake in recruiting you. So almost every freshman says four. Hmm. And then I say, what'd you get in the beep test? The beep test is a cardiovascular test. Any player can pass the beep. Our standard in the beep is 40. If you get 40 in the beep, you have worked 
your ass off all summer. I mean, you have worked your freaking ass off. You are fit if you've hit a 40 or above in the beat. So now I ask you, what'd you get on the beat? And you say, uh, 28. I said, okay, you want a four in self-discipline and the standard was 40 and you got a 28. I'm going to give you a 2.8. Now, if the player has an IQ above, you know, 100, what that player is going to sort out is I've taken her beep score and I've moved the decimal point over one. And so now she's an abject terror because she thinks that I have some sort of data point that's going to expose whatever she says the rest of the way. Mm -hmm. So now from this first one where she's flying high and yep, she wants to start. And now all of a sudden the standard is 40, which she didn't attain. Now she's a little bit nervous because now she's entered the world of what's called standards. <laughs> and this is scaring the shit out of her because she's already realized she's flubbed the initial standard on self-discipline. So it goes from there. You mentioned a minute ago, you have them memorize the values. And I know there, this is strategic. Can, can you walk through the reasoning behind that? Yeah. In the old days, uh, um, well, in the really old days, I'm one of these guys that loves to read. So I've read, you know, hundreds of business books. And what was interesting about all these business books I read when I was young is um, it was telling me that all the great companies um, have an extraordinary culture. And the culture is based on mission statements that they select, but also uh, the things they live by within the culture. And so I had all these, looking back, rather insipid statements about the way I wanted my culture to live. Things like, you know, we work hard or we don't whine. You know, we had all these different things. <clears throat> And uh, wasn't really working. So one day I'm reading the New York Times Magazine. And I'm reading this article by a woman that studied Russian literature at Columbia for her PhD. And she's talking about when she got to Columbia, they had just hired a Russian exiled poet by the name of Joseph Brodsky. Brodsky comes into Columbia and meets with all of his PhD candidates and says, um, oh, and by the way, one of your responsibilities is to memorize reams of Russian poetry and Russian literature. And she is shocked. And so are her Russian PhD candidate colleagues. They leave this meeting and they get together in a cabal and say, you know, I don't think this crazy Russian knows what he's talking about. This is Columbia. We are one of the world's greatest academic institutions. If he thinks he can come in here and tell us to memorize poetry, like elementary school children, he's absolutely wrong. Let's get together and let him know that uh, um, we're expecting a lot more from him than having us memorize all this literature and poetry. So sure enough, they go storming back into his office and Mr. Uh, uh, or Professor Brodsky, I'm so sorry, but... Uh, you're asking us to do something that in this country, elementary school children do. And um, my colleagues and I just don't feel like this is appropriate for students of our caliber. We are among the elite in the academic community in the country, and we expect more uh, from you. And he says, well, I also expect more from you. And if none of you guys memorize this, none of you guys will get your PhDs. <laughs> so with tails firmly tucked between their legs, they left his office and they got to work. And now in this article, she is confessing that Brodsky is absolutely right. By memorizing all of this stuff, obviously in Russian, their mental fabric changed, their attitude towards Russia changed, their conversations had different things to share that wouldn't have been there had they not memorized all this stuff. And she said it was transformational for her. So I'm thinking, you know what? None of this other stuff works. I'm going to attach a motivational quote next to every core value we have. So all of those things that I thought were insipid statements, we attached a quote that the kids memorize because I wanted them to know exactly what it feels like 
to live one of those core values. <clears throat> and then the team would evaluate every player against them. So we would have everyone's opinion on how every other player in the program was living each particular core value. And then uh, in the old days, I never shared it with anyone because I was so afraid that if I shared it with someone, I would be doing them mental health damage. And finally, this one girl that I was so angry with, I decided to share it with her just because I was just so upset with the way she treated the managers and the way she treated people. And she needed to know what her teammates thought of her character. And I shared it with her. And all of a sudden, she's sitting across the desk from me in cold silence. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, Anson, that was not the right move. You shouldn't have shared that with her. And I, I asked her, I said, well, uh, Mary, uh, are you glad I shared this with you? And in a very low voice, she didn't even look up. She kept looking down at her core value grades. And she said, yes. Mm -hmm. And then I said, why? Why are you glad I shared this with you? And then she looked up at me and she said, because I have to change. Her transformation before the end of her senior year was extraordinary. In her senior speech, and every senior gets to make a speech, I don't get to edit it, was amazing. And she talked about how after that player conference and after hearing the opinion of all of her teammates, she decided she had to make a change in everything that she was doing, the way she treated people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And her senior speech was just a remarkable contrition of her transformation into a better level of human being. And I loved it. From then on, we shared the grades with everyone. We did it differently. And now we're at a place for a while. We actually showed them where they ranked on the team. And that, I don't think that was positive. So now all we show are the top four. So they see the top four names. So I want them to know the role models on the team. Yeah. Uh, and then we showed her, her grades underneath that, but not a rank of where she stood. Hmm. And there's a black line. We want every player to live above a 3-0. Five is, an, I'm sorry, four is an extraordinary example of this core value. Three is lives this core value most of the time. Two is sometimes lives this core value. We want every girl and every core value to live above a three. And if they're below a three, we want them to fight to get above a three. And so we're experimenting with different leadership ideas actually this semester to see if we can get every one of our kids to live above a 3-0 average. So that's where we are now in the evolution of our character building and principal centered living building and speaking leadership of, for that matter. Yeah. Speaking of that evolution, how did you originally define the core values that you live? How do we define them? Yeah. Um, these are different things I thought were critical to create a great culture. Um, and, you know, we've tweaked it. Uh, all of the leadership council has to sign off on them every year. Uh, we changed them periodically. The 13th is new. It was changed by the 2012 Leadership Council. Uh, the 2022 Leadership Council changed a core value into something else. Uh, so this is uh, organic uh, because in order to uh, uh, live it, the leaders have to believe in it. And if they don't believe in it, uh, they can change it. Uh, obviously, I have veto power because even though uh, I have a benign dictatorship i still have the final say uh but i listen to my leaders and if they uh have a very strong opinion about something even though i might disagree with it i will generally go with it uh, and have them live with it as we see if their idea or mine would have been better of course one year uh, the leadership council came in and shared with me uh, uh this player they thought should be starting over someone else and that's the area where even though I don't have any rules, uh, the decisions I make are who plays, who starts, and how many minutes, and who travels. But this one particular team was very strong about trying to have this one kid uh, play. And I said, well, I disagree with you, uh, but I've won a lot of national championships, so I'm going to be fine if this thing blows up in your face. So we're going to go with your choice. And sure enough, it blew up in their face because they were wrong and I was right. And so basically they have to live with the things they disagree with. Um, and even though I've never, you know, met with them afterwards and said, you know, I told you so, 
the smarter ones were thinking, hmm, Anson was right. Anson, you were saying that you started to actually show where they ranked in the values. What other things do you wish you started doing sooner as a coach? Well, obviously, I wish I had done the core value thing immediately. Uh, but in order to do that, I think you have a, have to have a certain amount of confidence and maturity as a coach. Can you walk me through that? Anson, I'm, I'm, well, yeah. Your own yeah, personal journey? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the problem, uh, not the problem, the evolution for most of us that coach is when we first start coaching, we don't know if we're any good. Um, and so what you spend your, I guess, early years doing in coaching is trying to prove that you can win. And you're not really sure that you can yet. Even the most confident of us don't really know we can win yet. Um, and there's so many different factors that are involved in winning that have nothing to do with you. I mean, if every one of your players suck, you're going to lose. There's nothing you know <laughs> complex about that. And if you can't recruit good players, you're going to lose. There's nothing complex about that. If you recruit assholes, you're going to lose. There's nothing complex about that. So there's so many things that can get in the way of your success. And honestly, bad luck can get in the way of your success. A bad referee can get in the way of your success. Now, this year, we were winning with 16 seconds to go in the national championship final. And our goalkeeper was barged into the back of the net with 16 seconds to go. We're winning 2-1. That's a foul. The ref didn't call it. So there are a lot of different ways you can lose. So the trouble with coaching is your success and failure is very transparent. You're in the public eye. If you have your rear end handed to you regularly, <clears throat> um, that's not going to really construct your confidence, no matter who you are. And if you are the sort of person that does want to control your fate, you're going to take every loss personally and you're going to blame yourself. Why are you going to blame yourself? Because you're going to blame yourself because you're on the way to being a great coach. And if you're on the way to being a great coach, every single loss, you're going to figure out something you could have done that would have allowed you to win the game. And you're going to figure out a way to basically solve every issue you have. But initially, all you're trying to do is to sort out whether or not you can actually coach. So this thing I'm talking about right now, which should be a priority, very rarely with a young coach is it a priority. And yet the older you get, the more you realize it's the most important thing that you do. The most important thing you do at a collegiate level and at a youth level is invest in personal character. But the trouble is, what bubbles to the surface earliest is whether or not you're winning. So where do you spend all of your attention? In figuring out how to win by moving players around the field like chess pieces, where your queen is a nine, your castles are worth five, your bishops and horses are worth three, your pawns are worth one. And you're trying to sort out the value of each player with whatever numerical system you have in your own mind to evaluate your talent. And you try to move it around the field and try to have a system with the right numbers of the right people in the right places win games for you. You just don't have to have, you don't have the maturity yet to understand that what's going to move the needle for you is caring about your players in a human way and helping them evolve into higher level human beings. They care about each other. They care about working hard that care about being positive life forces. But when you're young, you just don't see that yet because you're so caught up in whether or not you're any good. And trust me, every time you lose, it's another mark against that. Anton, when for you, did it feel like you were wearing a glove with who you were as a coach? When did you get over that hurdle? Say that again? When, when did you get over that hurdle? When, when, when were you able to get past the winning and the losing and really start honing on these things, the things that you still look back 40 years later and say, this truly matters as a coach? When I started winning. <laughs> yeah, it's not complex. If I had done a lot of losing when I started coaching, I would have bailed. 
one of the things that I appreciate about what you've done over the years is your continual evolution. You even mentioned reading hundreds of books. For you, have there been books that you actually have gone back to over the years? Well, there's one I'm about to go back to, and I think it's worth sharing. One of the biggest problems we're having right now <clears throat> is the self-esteem movement. I read a great book by William Damon. I could get this wrong, but you can do your own research when we hang up. I think William Damon is a sociologist at the University of Pennsylvania. He wrote an absolutely wonderful book that I read when I was a very young coach. And I think the title of that book was Greater Expectations. The theme of that book, and again, this I read it so long ago, I could, you know, get some of this wrong. And if I do, uh, forgive me. But that book really impressed me a long time ago, maybe 20, 30 years ago. And um, the theme of that book was, we're raising our children in a most destructive way by catering to what was very popular back then. And maybe it was a... Um, what the children's books were telling us or the baby books were telling us and how we had to raise our kids. We had to raise them to have extraordinary self-esteem. So the way uh, I guess the, the old guard was recommending we construct self-esteem self -esteem was by praising our kids. Oh boy, did you do great just then? Oh, you know, this is good, that's good. And we're building this incredible self-esteem. I think William Damon came in with his book and basically uh, said, no, 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 no. We've done these kids a disservice because first of all, we've shattered the image of high standards because if everything they do is, is incredible and because we're trying to build their self-esteem, it's sort of the everyone gets a trophy thing. And as a result, standards are shattered because you know what? Not everyone deserves a trophy. And if everyone gets a trophy, what you've done is you've diluted standards because no, champions or winners get trophies and the ones that don't, don't. It's not complex. So if you want to get a trophy, here's what you got to do. You got to work yourself to death and you've got to win or, or something along those lines. So not only does this shatter standards, but it also shatters the respect of the child for authority. Because the authority figures in this child's life, the mother and father, have done nothing but praise the child. And way down deep is they know that, you know what, I don't think what I just did was particularly praiseworthy. So now they're losing respect for their authority figures. So what happens? Well, we're left with that. They come to me now, 17, 18 year olds. They've been praised their whole lives for basically not doing anything. And now they've got sort of a chip on their shoulder about authority figures because their authority figures have lied to them. We brought a sociologist in, in 2012. It was great. I loved what this guy presented. And honestly, I can't remember everything he said, although it was a brilliant presentation. He was our sociologist emeritus on our campus and his lecture was fabulous. I don't remember all of it, but I do remember the first two slides. The first slide had 1969 on it, and I'll never forget that because that was the year I graduated from high school. So obviously that year resonated with me. 1969, this kid's coming home from school. He's got all Fs on his report card, and the parents are screaming at the kid. Then it jumped to the year he was giving the lecture, which was 2012. The kid comes home from school, all Fs on his report card, and the parents are screaming at the teacher. So what he was telling us is the kids we're coaching now have a cabal of support where through the self-esteem movement, nothing they've ever done has been their fault. There's always been an excuse laced to any failure to protect their self-esteem. And so as a result, if they don't start for me or play well or anything else, it's not their fault. It's my fault. And that's a completely different dynamic in terms of getting a team or a player to his or her potential. So that's where we are right now. Those are the millennials. Those are the Gen Zs. And this is where employers are pulling their hair out with the millennials first. And now, of course, the Gen Zs. Because in the old days, if you got Fs, it was your fault. 
And now if you got an F, no, 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 no. Couldn't be your fault. We're building your self-esteem. Clearly, they don't understand the home you come from. And the fact I've been reading you children's books, you know, since you were two years old, the professor and teacher has it all wrong. It's clearly their fault. They don't know how to grade you properly. And so this is an issue. So that gets to your question about, am I evolving? Yep. I'm going to go back and reread that book because I want to be even better at getting someone's personal narrative to the truth as fast as possible. I want to know how I can shatter the ill effects of the self-esteem movement. And maybe William Damon somewhere in that brilliant book has written about that, that I can steal and reapply in 2023. Continuing to learn all the time. And this, this has me thinking about leadership and leaders we are. Can you teach leadership to your players? Or is this something you've discovered they just naturally have? First of all, that's an excellent question. And I'll share this with you. And this is genuine. I'm asked to speak on leadership regularly. And I always tell the, the people that are hiring me, you know, whether it's West Point or the Naval Academy or, you know, some leadership consortium uh, locally, I always say, well, listen, please know I'm going to cash your check for teaching leadership. But if someone in the crowd says, Anson, do you believe you can teach leadership? I'm going to say no. So there you go. Now, have I had some great leaders? Yeah. They were great leaders when I got them. And all I did was give them an opportunity to lead. Now, am I trying to teach leadership? I try to teach it constantly. I would tell you I'm a great teacher of leadership if three quarters of my kids graduate as good leaders. I can't tell you that. Because I know there's going to be a percentage that will never lead. But can I ask for at least, you know, 51% of them? I mean, can I put some sort of standard on my ability to teach leadership? And right now, honestly, I've had some incredible leaders that I cherish, but I've just put them in positions where they can lead. Now, have I tried to teach them leadership? Yep. But the person sitting next to them can't lead worth a lick. They are great leaders. And I'm sharing with both people the same stuff. So uh, should I really take credit for this great leader? No. So I, I, am, I am a harsh critic. Now, am I going to stop trying to teach it? No. But I'm not going to pat myself on the back until my leadership percentages are, I don't know whether I'll say it's 75%, but give me some sort of standard and it at least has to be 51%. I mean, don't you think? Yeah, I, mean, no, I, I appreciate yeah. 40 years of uh, direct experience with that. Yeah. That carries, that carries a lot of weight. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying. And, you know, uh, I'll let you know if I get there. Yeah. I'm experimenting with something now. Uh, you can check with me in a year and I'll tell you if it worked. And if it does work, I think, uh, and I'm writing a book right now on culture with a wonderful woman by the name of Christine Porath. Trust me, if this succeeds, it's going to be in the book. Hmm. But right now, do I think it's going to succeed? Well, I hope so. But, you know, I'm not overly confident because nothing else I've tried. The thing I've tried hardest that's almost impossible is to develop a verbal leader in women's athletics. Hmm. Have I had some female leaders that are really good verbally on the field in the heat of competition? Yes. Did I create them? No. I think they came in with that quality. Have I tried to develop verbal leaders every single year? Yes. I need verbal leaders. I need verbal leaders in every line. The front line, the midfield line, the defensive line, goalkeeper I would consider a line. I need leaders centrally. I need leaders on the right. I need leaders on the left. I want my team cross-pollinated with leadership because I think anyone that has a leadership quality um, can have an impact on the field for me if they will just open their mouths. Mm -hmm. Anson, this has been a lot of fun for me. Say you could do this. Sit down, ask tons of questions of anyone dead or alive. Who would you love to do that with? Hmm. I guess uh, from a soccer perspective, uh, 
My favorite people would be uh, uh, Arsene Wenger, the famous Arsenal coach, uh, Pep Guardiola, the Man City coach, um, Bielsa, who coached a Leeds for a while, and uh, let's see what other. Yeah, and I guess uh, Johan Cruyff, who is the great uh, Dutch master player, but also master coach. I think those four. Um, those are the people I would ask ask my soccer questions to. Uh, the ones that I would ask uh, leadership questions to would be uh, Winston Churchill. You spent a, a lot of years reading, listening to his speeches, right? Yep. No, he's. I'm a huge fan of his. Um, let's see, leadership. Hmm. I guess. Uh, Arthur Blank. Uh, if you have time, read his book, Good Company. He's the founder of Home Depot, right? Correct. Yep. I really admire uh, everything in that book. I think he's the future for uh, business leadership. Um, Stephen Covey. And right now, all of my uh, sophomores read Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Every spring, they're reading it right now with me. We have book club set up. And if I had to pick a fourth. Hmm. I'm trying to pick a historical figure. Let's see how this war goes. If it goes well, I'm picking Zelensky. Coach, I know you have a, a lot of incredible resources, your books, your podcasts. I want to make sure the listeners can become aware of those. Where do you want the listeners going uh, if, if they want to learn more about you uh, and the incredible work that you've done and put out there for over 40 plus years? Well, I appreciate that. Well, first of all, if they're interested in the cauldron, this book is still a bestseller. It's what you know Pete Carroll read uh, to structure his teams at USC and then uh, obviously in the NFL. Uh, it's a book that's still selling like hotcakes and Volleyball, obviously soccer and basketball. Um, that book is titled Training Soccer Champions. And just to share a story about that book, uh, I got a call from the publisher one day and he said, Anson, uh, do you know what uh, Training Soccer Champions is selling on eBay as used copies? I said, no. He says, it's selling for a hundred bucks. I said, are you freaking kidding me? Because I had a whole, you know, gosh, stack of those books i'm saying i'm going to be rich uh and he said do you mind if we publish it without a correction to read this book do you mind if we just publish it as is and i said no problem and if i got my check this year for training soccer champions it was huge that book is still flying off the shelves, even though I wrote it in the early 90s. Um, so if you want to know about the cauldron and also some insights around, you know, mentality and everything else, buy Training Soccer Champions. That's a book I, read, I wrote for coaches. If you want to dig deeper into the culture that we have here at UNC, then buy the book I wrote for players. And I did a podcast on it, which forced me to reread it. And it's also an excellent book. And that book is Vision of a Champion. And that's a book I, I wrote for players. And then along with that book, I did a podcast. And this was during the pandemic. And the podcast is as the same name as the book. It's Vision of a Champion. Every single chapter in that book has a podcast personality attached to it that I'm interviewing along with Dean Linky. Uh, and it's fantastic. I mean, Tobin Heath, Crystal Dunn, you know, all of these great American players, Mia Hamm, Christine Lilly. You know, all these amazing American players are on my podcast with me and some wonderful coaches. I mean, Roy Williams, uh, Mac Brown, our football coach here. And so basically it's got, you know, all these great coaches in, in, in many sports, but these great players. That podcast would be great to listen to along with reading Vision of a Champion. Yeah. And then for, for, the, for the listeners, I, I loved your podcast, Coach. Uh, I loved the episodes with Tobin Heath, Mia Hamm. Uh, they were exceptional. So if, you, if you're fans of the, this podcast, what got you there? I know you will love that podcast as well. So that'll be linked up as well. Well, I appreciate that. And then the other piece is uh, 
Uh, Tim Carruthers, a Sports Illustrated senior writer, calls me up out of the blue years ago and says, Anson, uh, I'm fed up with interviewing NBA players. Uh, they don't want to do any interviews. They sit down in front of an interviewee and they, they're not interested in answering any questions. They're also jaded. Um, this is driving me crazy. I want to come down and write a book with you. Uh, do you mind if I spend a year with you and write a book about you and your culture? I said, not an issue. You know, Tim, come on down. Tim comes down. He doesn't spend one year with us. He spends five years with us. And what does he do? He doesn't write does a hagiography where he's just talking to people that like me. He has a whole chapter on everyone that hates me. He has a chapter on all my critics who got to say anything they like about me. Uh, and this five years with me, he interviewed so many players in the program from the beginning, and including the players that were there with me now. I didn't close him off from anything. He came to every pregame meeting. He came to all my player conferences. I didn't hide anything from him. I told him, you know, he could talk to anyone. Um, I had nothing to hide. And so basically he wrote a 1000 page book and the publisher said, we can't sell a book. That's a thousand pages. You got to hammer this down to underneath 500. So I think it's like 400 some pages long and the title of the book, and it's an excellent book. My wife was reading the manuscript in bed one night and was laughing and laughing and laughing. And she wanted to read me passages of, it. I said, honey, you don't have to read me anything. I live that. <laughs> Please don't read anything to me. I, I know my life is filled with hilarity. And one reason it is, I've never taken myself that seriously. And so his book is a gem. And the title of that book is The Man Watching by Tim Carruthers. And it's a story of uh, our culture. And so I would recommend anyone that's interested in digging deep into our culture to read all three books. The most interesting one to read, honestly, is not mine. It's Tim Carruthers's. Um, but if you want to know about the culture, read training. If you want some depth into the players I've coached, uh, listen to that podcast, as you've said. And if you're a youth player or a coach that wants to be better at coaching soccer, uh, grab uh, uh, the vision of a champion. And so those would be uh, uh, the things I would recommend. Uh, and I appreciate you allowing me to uh, still those. So, so thank you. Thank you, coach. <laughs>